Let's turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. And I'm going to step a little bit out of our series for today. And I uh, trust we'll be able to um, hear from the Lord this morning. It's a familiar passage of Scripture, but uh, one that we often um, hear just a singular verse out of this chapter. Uh, but I, I know that the Lord will speak to our hearts and uh, we'll uh, trust that you'll allow him to uh, have his way uh, in your life. So Second Chronicles chapter number 7, we're going to begin reading in verse number 11 again, and then we'll read down through the end of this chapter and uh, in verse 22 there. So Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says here, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, and this is the familiar verse in verse 14, that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will open and my ears uh, attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I had covenanted it with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I have given you in this house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all the people. And at this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, do thank you for another opportunity to stand and to preach your word. Now, Lord, we're thankful that we can come and uh, uh, celebrate another opportunity to worship and to be with your people, to be around uh, fellow believers, and to be able to uh, just uh, take some truths away from God's Word that would help us to uh, draw closer to you, to live uh, more faithfully uh, according to your Word. And God, just pray that you'd help us today to be attentive, uh, to listen to what you'd have for us. And uh, God, we just pray that your will would be done. For us in your Son's precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Well, with today being the first Sunday of uh, 2021, I wanted to uh, just take this time out to preach a message uh, that I hope will help us uh, as we go through. And I've been racking my brain for as long as I can, uh, and uh, that sometimes is a hard task, so it sometimes takes longer than uh, it should. But I was trying to find a creative way to uh, kind of uh, illustrate that a, a new year is a time for resolutions. It's a time for uh, some corny jokes to tell, like I haven't seen you since last year when you see somebody for the first time. I like using that, uh, but it doesn't always uh, go over like I, I'd like it to. And uh, now that we can say 2020 is truly hindsight for us, it is behind us and all those kinds of things. So I'm sure you've heard and uh, maybe you'll get later if you enjoy those. But we uh, do, for some reason, uh, like to make uh, New Year's resolutions uh, on January 1st that actually are going to begin tomorrow, we think, in our minds on Monday, uh, because who wants to start something? new on a weekend. That just doesn't make sense, does it? So we uh, set aside a time like this to, uh, to decide to change some things in our lives. And why, why do we do that? We do that because there is obviously something uh, in our lives that we are not satisfied with. There is something we'd like to achieve that we haven't yet achieved. There's uh, some goals that we have set for ourselves that haven't come our way, or maybe 
uh, like all of us can say that this past year was not the greatest of years uh, with all of the things that we had going on in our lives. And so it is the uncomfortableness of life. Uh, it is the unsatisfaction with where we are in life that says, hey, let me do something uh, to change my future. Uh, to change the outcome of what I am currently getting. And oftentimes what we find is that those changes are very elusive. In fact, uh, your resolutions this year are probably the exact same resolutions you set forth last year. Right? Anybody else like me have just about the same list every single year? You don't even have to make the list anymore because it is so similar. Change is hard. And we've come to a text today that, like I said, is very familiar and has been used a lot uh, to uh, talk about how uh, new things can be experienced or even how old things can be reachieved is uh, how we can get back to a place where we are not uh, experiencing uncomfortableness or dissatisfaction, uh, but we can experience once again the blessings of God, as this passage would put it. This passage of Scripture is a interesting one because it is well known but it is not always well used in application to help us understand how it applies to where we are today in our lives. Uh, it sometimes is misunderstood that this passage of scripture is specifically written to a nation of Israel in response to a prayer that Solomon prayed. David was the original one that was given the task to build the grand uh, temple of God. We know that through uh, the things that happened in his life, he was not able to achieve that goal that had been set forth for him. And that was passed down to his son Solomon. And Solomon, uh, man, he spared no expense in making the house of God as good as he could possibly make it uh, with what was available to him at that day. It was a majestic thing to behold. And after the building of the temple, Solomon held a special service to uh, kind of dedicate the temple to God and to uh, especially commemorate this period of time in Israel's history. And so if you look back with me, I want to point out to you ex exactly where we get verse chapter 7 from. And this is at the dedication. And Solomon, I want you to look at verse 12 in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 verse 12. The Bible says here that then Solomon stood and before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. And Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide and three cubits high and had set it in the court and he stood on it. Then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel. He's obviously praying here. There is no God like you in heaven or, or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. He continues praying, but I want you to skip down to verse 24. And this is still in the midst of this prayer. He says, If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and they turn again and acknowledge your name and plead with you in this house. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave them to them and to their fathers. Notice what he says here in verse 26. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. If they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin, when you afflict them... Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servant, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon their land, when you, which you have given to their people as an inheritance. For the sake of time, I just want to read just the headings of the next few sections. Verse 28, he says, if there is a famine in the land. Verse 32, it says, likewise, when a, a, a foreigner comes into your country. Verse 34, if your people go out to battle. Verse 36, if they sin against you and he goes on and he finishes this prayer basically asking God that if there ever comes a time again in his country uh, with his nation with his people where they turn back uh, turn their back against God 
where they are no longer living to honor you, where they're no longer living their lives in dedicated commitment to the, uh, to the commands that you have given to them. And if they have to go through periods where uh, you withhold rain from them and there's a severe drought in the land and there's no food to eat and there's no uh, sustenance for them to enjoy, if they have to go through that again and then they turn back to you, essentially, will you forgive them? Will you again restore them back to this place? See, Solomon was wise enough to know, uh, based off of his nation's past uh, 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 example, uh, through the way they lived their lives, that this was going to happen. They were going to fall back into sin again. And he's saying, God, if that ever happens, will you promise me that you'll forgive them? And that's where Second Chronicles 7 comes in, that God looks at Solomon and says, Yes, Solomon, if there comes a time where they are living in sin, there comes a time where they are uh, struggling with life and they've turned their back on me, but yet they turn their back to me and pray and ask for forgiveness and repent, yes, I will heal their land. Yes, I will allow them to enjoy the blessings and the favor of God again on their lives. And I want us to see from... This response that God gives to Solomon, that you and I can trust that no matter how far away we may get from God, uh, no matter what decisions we may uh, make that brings the discipline and the punishment of God in our lives that causes struggles to happen, or even when there are such things in our lives as the things that we have experienced in 2020 that are far beyond our control and are not the direct result of our sin or our actions, that there are some commitments that we can make to God that we can trust that God will always look after us. He will provide for us. That doesn't mean he's always going to instantly wipe away all of our troubles but it does mean that we can have an inner peace and satisfaction with God that no matter how difficult or how chaotic or no matter what may come our way that we can have a peace with God that will sustain us through all of this so what are the commitments we see here the first commitment I draw your attention to is the commitment to obedience if you read through 2 Chronicles chapter number 6, what you see Solomon saying, God, if, they, if we will just be obedient to what you've told us to do. Very often their troubles and their trials came from direct disobedience to what God had told them to do. They, like us, uh, often thought, man, we've got this figured out. Uh, we can figure out how we can go from point A to point B on our own. Uh, we can figure out how to win this battle or that battle. We don't always need God to be directly watching over us and instructing us. And very often, every time they disobeyed God, they would lose. Uh, they would face some kind of punishment like Moses not being able to uh, uh, enjoy the, the promises that God had provided. And David here also not being able to see the temple uh, fulfilled and completed. And then God says, yes, if you will return uh, to being obedient to me, I will forgive you and I will restore you and I'll bring you back to this place that you have enjoyed. And it is so simple yet so difficult for us that as believers, if we would just commit ourselves to being obedient to what God has commanded us to do, we would instantly get rid of a lot of the worries that we face, a lot of the anxiety that we feel and a lot of the troubles that we endure. You really can sum up the Ten Commandments or all of God's commandments to us just simply in the great commandment that He has given us, that we are to love the Lord God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, all of our strength, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. And really, if you could just do that, you're really able to be obedient to all of it. it when, when we look at all the commands of God, maybe even just looking at the Ten Commandments, man, that can get overwhelming. Uh, as we think about all of the uh, different rules and laws that are put forth and all the things that even Jesus says and that Paul uh, and Peter and James and John would go on to write, it really can seem like, man, how in the world can I ever remember to do all these things that God has told me to do? Well, the simple way is just to love God above anything and everything, to truly be affectionate for Him. And that will change the decisions you make. That'll change the way you live your entire life. And then if you're loving your neighbor or your brother or your sister like you love yourself, that surely would solve a lot of the relational problems that we have in life because we often struggle 
with loving ourselves way better than we love those people that are in our lives. So the great commandment, but we also think about the great commission. When Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to baptize them, to carry the gospel out into the world, it's a simple yet very difficult thing to do to remember that we are to live our lives as a testament uh, of the, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the change that has taken place in our lives. And oftentimes we struggle with this because we think if I'm not doing anything bad, that, doesn't, that means I'm not being disobedient. If I'm not living my life in quote unquote sin, then I could say truly that I'm being obedient to God's word. But there's two ways that we can be disobedient. One's by commission where we're actually committing a sin that goes against God's word. But there's also the uh, the, the area of omission where we're not doing what God has commanded us to do that we are neglecting to do some things that God has asked us to do in his word or instructed us to do and just by not doing them we're allowing ourselves to fall into a life of disobedience and oftentimes what you and I do is if we're not avoiding obedience through omission where we're just trying not to do bad things instead of living out good things, we try to oftentimes disguise uh, uh, our disobedience by just going through the motion and the appearance of acting like we're doing something and doing something right. A good example of this would be the great commandment to go spread the gospel. And the easier thing for us to do is not to say, hey, you're a sinner in need of a savior. It's a lot easier to say, hey, would you go to church with me this Sunday? Would you come to our church, maybe Sunday school, or maybe it's a Wednesday night, or maybe it's a special event, and we oftentimes want to just gloss over and say, man, that I'm fulfilling my duty by just by doing that, and it's great. I, I'm not encouraging not to invite people to church. Like, you need to be inviting people to church, and especially during this time where a lot of people can't go to church or are not able to attend their church, invite them to our church. They don't have to stay here once their church opens back up, but we'd love to have any and everybody uh, that wants to come. As we've said before, we'd like to be nervous because we have so many people here worshiping and uh, trying to do things a little bit differently, but it's good to invite people to church, but God never said, hey, invite people to church. He said, invite people to me. He said, share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And we have to remember what Samuel said. Uh, it says, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings or in sacrifices? In other words, out of, out of doing ritualistic things as much as in obeying the Lord. And then he says, look, to obey is better than sacrifice and to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. And oftentimes in our lives, when we are unsatisfied with where we are, where we are struggling with not being able to achieve the things that we had hoped to achieve in our lives, or be at a position in life where we really wanted to be and we're frustrated and struggling, we look for everything in the world to do to change that instead of just doing what we know to do. H.B. Charles Jr. put it this way when he said, Stop asking God to bless what you're doing and start doing what you already know God is blessing. And we'll say that again. He said, Stop asking God to bless what you're doing and start doing what you already know God is blessing. Quite simply, it is a reminder that we just commit to being obedient to God's word. Now, that doesn't earn us God's favor. We're not going to get into heaven because we can say, look at all the obedient things we did this past year. But I can assure you that when you live your life in simple obedience to God's word, it will allow you to endure years like 2020 without getting to the end of it, frustrated over what didn't happen or what did happen. So committing to obedience. I want to show you the second thing, though, and that is committing to worship. Committing to worship. If you look back there with us, at uh, just so you can see from the text where it's coming from, in verse uh, 14, he simply it gives the response, if, uh, and this follows the, the statement that when I shut up the heavens, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and, and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. And then he goes on to tell Solomon in verse 17, And as for you, uh, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, and to do according to all that I have commanded you, keeping my statutes and my thrones, 
Then verse 19, he says, But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you from the land that I have given you and the house that I have consecrated for my name. So Solomon is asking God, if we do what's right, will you bless us? But God's saying that, yes, that, that is true. But it's also to be understood that if you forsake these things, that you'll also experience some of the punishment of God. You'll have to go through some times of being cast out of your land and being in bondage and those kinds of things. And the main downfall throughout all of the nation of Israel's history, you remember it well, is their struggle with idolatry. Over and over again, it's almost um, uh, like a script that they kept following. Every time they went into a new land, uh, they were introduced to new gods, they were introduced to new forms of worshiping, all kinds of different things. They said, man, what a great idea. Let's worship God and let's worship these idols as well. And we know that did not work out too well for them, right? Every single time it brought down the wrath of God. He would put it this way in Exodus. He said, instead, you must tear down their, their altars, the false god altars, and smash their sacred pillars, and chop down their Asherah poles, because the Lord is jealous for his reputation, and you are never to bow down to another god. He is a jealous god. And I'm convinced that for you and I, one of, the, one of the things we must be reminded of as we desire to see a, a change in our lives, to see a better year, is a reminder that we must worship God and worship Him alone. And you say, but then I do that. When we come to church here, there's no other idols that are setting up there. Uh, when I go home, there's no other kind of idol or altar that's set up for me to go and worship. I don't struggle with worshiping other gods. But I asked you the question, do you really believe that? That there are no other gods that are in your life? Worship is not just what we do on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Worship is not just what's done inside of this building. We live our lives in worship every single day. Every single hour of that day, every single moment of that day. Ask yourself the question, what am I really worshiping? What is it truly that has my affection? What is it that truly gets my uh, uh, uh Whatever it is for you, goosebumps that may come up on the back of your neck if that's you or uh, gets a little uh, uh, tapping going on in your foot or uh, wants you to shout and run the aisles or whatever it may be. What is it that truly gets me to the place where I, I am uh, experiencing uh, this type of worship and this type of affection? One commentator would say this, the words uh, referring again to this passage here in Second Chronicles, speak to us also. No height attained, no work done, no blessing received is in itself sufficient to ensure our continuance in, fa in favor. Nothing but fidelity could do that. J.I. Packer would say this. He said, this then is worship in its largest sense. Petition as well as praise. Preaching as well as prayer. Hearing as well as speaking. Action as well as words obeying as well as offering, loving people as well as loving God. However, the primary acts of worship are those which focus on God directly. And we must not imagine that work for God in the world is a substitute for direct fellowship with Him in praise and prayer and devotion. One thing 2020 has done is it has, I, I believe, revealed a lot of idols that you and I struggle with. A lot of things that we worship. A lot of things that we oftentimes misplace affection that should be directed towards God with affection for those things. Sports is a big thing in our country, in our society. I know not everybody in here uh, struggles with that idolatry and that, uh, that uh, uh, temptation to worship. I'll be honest, I, I do. And thankfully, right now, it's not as much of a draw as it uh, was then. Uh, but man, it was, it was a, a shock to my senses when uh, the ACC tournament was canceled, uh, and then the NCAA tournament was canceled, and then uh, uh, the NBA basketball stopped, and all of those things. And I'm like, man, what in the world do I watch on TV if there's not any sports to watch? There is nothing else worth watching on TV. I still stand by that. Nothing else is worth watching on TV but sports. And uh, I don't watch it most of the time. I, I sit there and pretend to be watching maybe from time to time. Academics. 
is another big God in our society. And yes, I do not think our academic situation is in a good spot. And I fear for the future of our children and what they're enduring. I do. But it's also a great reminder that that isn't everything. Getting a good degree, getting a good job, moving up in society is going to burn up one day, just like everything else when we stand before God. Our work, a lot of people not able to go to work. A lot of people have lost their businesses forever. Unfair to them. I hate it. I, you know, I, I wish some decisions had been made differently to avoid that. Financial woes. Physical woes. Just about everything that our culture and society struggles with worshiping instead of God has had a hard hit this year. And a stark reminder to us that let's not get back to the place where we are worshiping those things above God. Even for us as Christians, we haven't been able to have a lot of special services. Uh, We haven't been able to enjoy the lunches that we enjoy. We haven't been able to uh, have a lot of events and outreach events and all the things that normally go into an active church. And all, quote unquote, all we've been able to do is have church. Maybe it's a reminder that that's what church is all about, coming to worship God. All those things are good. All those things are necessary. But let us commit to worshiping God and God alone and all those other things being kept in their proper place. I see a third commitment here that the Bible brings out that we need to commit to in 2021. That is a commitment to repentance. The main thrust of this passage, you could say, is repentance. Look back at verse 14. He said, if my people... Who are called by my name will humble themselves, and humility is obviously a part of repentance, and they'll seek my face. I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Sin is obviously what brought them to the point of needing to find repentance and restitution. Now, this morning, I don't want anybody to think that it is your personal sin that has caused 2020 to be a year for everybody. Can you imagine us getting to heaven and God saying, I brought down COVID-19 because of your sin and all the world had to endure that. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? Aren't you thankful you're in heaven and not on earth because you would be experiencing some uh, pain probably uh, if you were the cause of that. I'm, I'm not saying that sin is the direct cause of that, of what we've endured. But would we not be remiss to ask ourselves the question, is there not sin in our lives that needs to be dealt with that this time could remind us of, that there may be sin within our church community, within our nation, within our world, that God is trying to get our attention and has used a tool like uh, the difficulties of this past year to remind us the need for repentance? Can I ask you, Christian, when's the last time you truly repented of some specific sin in your life? Oftentimes we like to throw the blanket over our sin where we'll be ready to go to bed at night and we'll say, God, forgive me. And then we use those magic words, if I have failed you. Do you really think there's an if there? Do you really think we need to put that qualifier on? If by any chance I did anything in the past week that wasn't right with you, would you forgive me? No, more than likely it is. God, I have sinned. God, there is wrong in my life. Would you forgive me? Would you help me find Repentance, And this is a reminder to us here in 2 Chronicles that if we want the favor of God on our lives, if we want the blessing and the peace with God that we so desire, and that is ultimately what we we're seeking for when we want something good in life, it comes through repentance. And I believe that as we worship God and follow through with Him, we will find that. Let me give you the encouragement from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then my favorite psalm, Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, and as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on his children, uh, on those who fear him. The final thing I'd like to draw your attention to this morning is that is that we must commit to being dependent upon him. Amen. Ultimately, the struggle that the children of Israel had over and over again, it always came down to where were they going to place their dependence? Were they going to be dependent upon God or were they going to be dependent upon a earthly king? Were they going to be dependent upon God or were they going to be dependent upon their own wisdom? 
Were they going to be dependent upon God or were they going to be dependent upon their own riches? And as you read 2 Chronicles 7 and you understand what Solomon has asked for and what God has promised, I believe you could sum it up by saying that if they'll come to a place where they are completely dependent upon him, then they could find themselves in the favor of God again. Jeremiah chapter 17 puts it this way. Uh, This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person. Listen to that. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper in the air, but he cannot see when good comes, but dwells in uh, the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land where no one lives. But notice the contrast here. The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by the water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? You know what Jeremiah said? You trust in man, you'll always be disappointed. You trust in God, you'll always be satisfied. And I believe that the difficulties of this past year and the excitement of a new year should cause us to renew our commitment to be dependent upon God. Not dependent upon ourselves. Not dependent upon a president. Not dependent upon a political party. Not dependent upon a health care system. Not dependent upon anything. Not our finances. Not banks. Not the stock market. Not anything other than God for our survival. That we need Him. That we need to trust in Him. So oftentimes you and I struggle with this idea of dependence upon God. Because even as we deal with our sin, it still comes down to what can I do to improve this situation? What can I do to make up for what I've done? And I believe what we see here is God saying the people of Israel need to get back to being dependent upon Him. In the year 1992, uh, the... U.S. Olympics men's basketball team decided that they were tired of losing to other countries in a sport that was founded here and that we had the best best athletes in the world um, in, the best, obviously, professional league that existed and still exists to this day. So they finally decided instead of sending college kids to the Olympics, they were going to send our professionals. And you may know the team well, uh, included uh, Michael Jordan, uh, would include, um, as, uh, I was only like four years old when this happened, so I have to remember. Uh, Patrick Ewing, I think, may have been on that team. John Stockton, uh, I was trying to think of some other. Magic Bird, uh, uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, uh, I combined those two names. And there was only one college basketball player on that team. Do you know who that was? Christian Leitner of your Duke University Blue Devils, the only college player on the team. The coach... <laughs> The coach was Chuck Daly. Coach K was an assistant on that team, but Coach <laughs> Chuck Daly was uh, was the the head basketball coach. I I do believe he did uh, come from Carolina. I believe he coached there at one time, if I'm not mistaken, or had some connections to one of those two schools. But anyway, back to the moral of the story. It had nothing to do with Duke. It has everything to do with the Olympic team. Well, Coach Daly scheduled a scrimmage against college basketball players. And again, these are the best of the best. I mean, you take every single um, all-star and and really only a select few of the all-stars to make this team up. They had this scrimmage against uh, unknown college players, and the Dream Team lost the game to college players. Now, you could ask a lot of people what happened, but there's there's some people – and a lot of people with, with, uh, who I trust with basketball knowledge, they would tell you that, that Coach Daly lost that game on purpose. He didn't make the adjustments that would normally be made. He didn't make the substitutions that you would normally expect. He allowed certain things to go on that normally would have never gone on in a, in a real game, and he lost the game on purpose. Why would a coach lose a game on purpose? It was to teach his team some humility. It was to remind them that they're not incapable of being beat. 
that unless they go out and play every single game as if it's the last game they'll ever play, they use every single possession as the most valuable possession of that game. And unless they keep to the fundamentals of the game of basketball, no matter how good they are, they can be beaten. Can I tell you that we as Christians need years like 2020 to teach us a little bit of humility? To remind us of our vulnerability? To remind us that unless we can commit to the fundamentals of the Christian faith and trust in God, that man, we can, we can hit rock bottom. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you will follow this special formula that you'll never have to worry about sickness. You'll never have to worry about financial struggles. You'll never have to worry about disappointments. You'll never have a relationship problem. You'll never find yourself in financial difficulty. You'll never find yourself with heartache and pain. But what I am telling you, is that if we can commit ourselves to being obedient to God, obviously after we've placed our faith and trust in Him, if we can commit ourselves to worshiping Him above all else and not replacing Him with anything, if we'll commit to repenting when we have sinned and when sin is brought to our attention, if we'll commit to being dependent upon Him, that we will have the favor and the blessings of God on our lives. We will have a peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll have a joy that can't be stolen from us. And no matter what difficulties 2021 may bring, we can get through it on the other side knowing that we have God. And that's the most important thing we can have. And that He will see us through it. And He'll give us always what we need exactly when we need it.